Welcome to episode two of Playing with Research in Health and Physical Education. Uh, today's guest is Dr. Ash Casey, and we talk about his uh, review of literature on models-based practice. Uh, this is actually the, his second highest cited article um, on Google Scholar. So it's been read uh, widely. It gives a really good background of models and how students learn and teachers uh, work with curriculum models in general. Uh, great podcast. Hope you uh, have a good listen and make sure that you uh, share this with your other colleagues uh, and uh, show some love. We're here with that Dr. Ash Casey from Loughborough University in the UK. Uh, we'll be discussing his 2014 article titled Models Based Practice, Great White Hope or White Elephant. Uh, thank you so much for joining us to talk about your article. It's a pleasure. Uh, so can you give me a bit of a background of the research preceding this article? Maybe give us an overview of what models are and why we actually teach with them. Well, the background to the paper was actually uh, I was working with David Kirk at uh, University of Bedfordshire, and uh, he asked me to do a small piece on a paper that we were writing around models-based practice. And, and what I came back with was a review of literature. <laughs> um, so I kind of took this little thing that he expected a few words on and gave him a, a review of literature. And he went, uh, thanks for that. Um, we're not sure we can use this. Um, but then I looked at what I'd done and realized that it was a really interesting sort of take and then a look at um, the whole you know, the emerging notion of models-based practice. Uh, I like good titles, so The Great White Hope, White Elephant worked really well in terms of whether it really was the savior of the subject or whether it was a gift that was more expensive to, um, to what keep than it was to give. And I, you know, a lot of the work I've been doing more recently is around what is a model? Um, okay, so the way I would think about a model now is probably a little different to the way I may have considered it then. But I'd say that a model is um, is an aspiration. It's it's a way of of aligning uh, theoretical perspectives, pedagogical perspectives, um, and learning um, around um, potential aspirational outcomes. Uh, so models are things that have been uh, thought of theoretically. They've been problematized, and they, that you know, they come with under a certain framework. Uh, those frameworks have then been tested with young people, with teachers, with coaches in schools, and it's kind of a, a reconsideration process where the model moves backwards and forwards between those contexts until you get a sense of or, or, or a strong indication that if taught in this way, then these are the types of outcomes that you will get. Um, but the models need to be adaptive to the localized context, to the expertise of the teacher, to the, the prior learning of the students, to the knowledge that's being taught, to what's valued. Um, and I think in that way, it's probably a little more fluid, uh, more, of a, more of a verb than a noun, as I argued more recently, um, than maybe I may have seen it when I initially wrote this paper. Right. And so some of the models that you cover here, sport education, teaching gains for understanding, cooperative learning, um, you talk about, uh, you quote Launder in 20, 2001 about how model space practice may be too tough for teachers. And they state that they're akin to airplanes that could only be flown by test pilots. Um, do you still kind of uh, believe in that? I think that if you take the... Uh, I'm not sure I like this term, but the full model. So if you took if you took um, Seen Top's um, book and you and you looked at the full model, I mean the book is 200 pages thick. There's lots and lots of examples about how you might do it absolutely brilliantly. Now that's an aspiration. It takes a lot of time to get to that process. Uh, but if you if you if you that was an aeroplane, you put a beginner pilot in there, and then they'd crash it. Um, but you don't put beginner pilots into airplanes like that. You put them into simulators. You put them into you know less less complex, less less difficult. And in order to 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 to, to fly a a test plane, you need to be an expert. And I think that's the aspiration here in terms of models, in terms of how do you become an expert? 
if I take myself, I mean, one of the models I talk about in the paper that I've written and used myself, and I still I use almost daily when I'm t t t t teaching is co co cooperative learning. It's taken me a lot of years to become good enough to fly that, I suppose, to use that analogy uh, in the way that I do now. But I could use it 10 years ago. Right. I just needed to be aware of what I was doing and what I was aspiring to. So I think if we talk about the the full version, uh, as Kurt, 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 Kurt and Smith talked talk, talk, talk about this, not the watered down or the cafeteria approach, but the full version, then it, it does take a lot of time to learn. And that's that expertise and, and experience that's required to, to, to use the full model. But I don't think that's that should be prescriptive or, or should be used to limit people in using those approaches. Okay. So what led you to, I mean, you talked a little about uh, David Kirk earlier, but what were you trying to find out with the, with this research review? Well, my PhD was a, a model-based approach. So I was a teacher in a, in a secondary school. I taught very much um, a command style, to use a, a Moston term, very, very teacher-led. Uh, did my master's degree actually at Loughborough University. Uh, and I was working with uh, people like Kathy Armour and David Kirk and John Evans and was challenging kind of my own pedagogical approach. And I, I came to realize that I was uh, stereotypical. Uh, I followed, you know, the norms, I suppose, in, in, in how I taught. And I was very interested in adopting a, a models-based approach. And I, I started with cooperative learning and did a bit of sport education and some teaching teacher teaching gains from understanding and then decided to look over time at what it meant to adopt a models based approach. Uh, David was my PhD supervisor so he was talking about these processes at the time um, and I suppose I was I was getting more and more embedded into a, into models and what it meant to do it in daily practice um, and I think the vocabulary of the field has changed I think have you mentioned models based practice even 10 years ago, then not many people would have known what you meant. I think that's changed. People are much more a favor with it. But that's because of the nature of the conversations within the field, the way it's developed in uh, field education, teacher education, the way it's being used in schools. Um, but no one had actually looked at what it meant to be um, um, to adopt a models based practice approach. And that was my PhD. Um, but I suppose it, I know what it took me to deliver a, probably 50% of my timetable through models. So were we actually, was there too much? What was the evidence base saying about what models are, what a models-based practice approach might be? I mean, was it too expensive? Was it too difficult to fly, as, as Lord just said? Or actually, was it usable? And, and what did the, the literature say about that? Um, you know, I was able to bring together, um, you know, 45 papers that talk specifically about teaching. And then in, in undergoing that almost by accident review of literature in the first instance, but then making it very very systematic uh, and actually using De De David in that respect as a critical friend allowed me to, to sort of pick out, well, it was difficult to do, but it really could be the answer. But these are the things that we need to consider. So that's kind of the the background behind the purpose of the study it was to see whether what I'd done was doable. <laughs> was it realistic or was it just something that could be done as a PhD? Right. And so you went through and you found um, 45 different articles in a variety of different journals and through databases. And so you went through the um, the analysis and we won't go too much into the methods section, but um, you you had these five themes emerge from from the study. Can you kind of explain and describe those different five themes that came out? Yeah, I mean, you know, the first theme was around change for teachers, um, and it was about them identifying a personal need or desire to change, um, both their approach and their, their perceptions of what it was to teach. Um, and you know some of the earlier work, Alexander and Lutman, for example, reported over 400 t t teachers expressing positive feelings towards sport education, and this was replicated across a number of studies. Um, 
you know, it allowed primary school teachers or elementary school teachers to overcome their discomfort. It was a kind of a scaffolding process in terms of how they did it, their discomfort with teaching a specialist subject as non-specialist. Uh, it allowed uh, teachers to change their position in the classroom from just being a teller to, to adopting new ways. But it also required them to learn new ways of teaching. So they became learners themselves. So there was that kind of inherent motivation to, to learn uh, some teachers reported kind of a blurring of the boundaries between teachers and students in terms of how those very fixed roles were, were undertaken. Um, but in, in, in the same way, some teachers struggled to shake off their, their previous appro approaches, not being the centre of attention, not being the dominant voice was not always an easy thing to do. And it was hard to sustain change. Uh, in other papers, we've talked about uh, the honeymoon period. So this place where it's really euphoric and everything's going really, really well, uh, when you're using the model, you're making successes. But then, you know, in, in, if you use the same analogy, you've got the seven-year itch. So, you know, you get to that stage of where, okay, is this hard? Is it hard to maintain these processes? Um, and there was this notion of it was difficult and it took time. So it wasn't an easy fix. So the second thing was, was kind of around... Uh, learning new approaches, um, it takes considerable time to learn a new model, um, and you get this notion of being um, being a beginner teacher again, so that you're you're um, you're working really hard. It's labour intensive. You're not able to to draw on prior knowledge. You're having to make decisions, and I've referred to this in other places as you know gaining sort of pedagogical fluency, so understanding how a model works. It's like learning a new Latin. A language when you first start you're, you're always looking in the phrase book you're always you've got very stilted ways of talking and as you become more fluent and understanding eventually you start to think in that language so it's just beginning to understand you know how those processes work and for some it was too high a cost they didn't like being a beginner there was too much time invested in learning and that's when you know they started to um people start to tail off that they move beyond the honeymoon and, and they don't maintain this Okay, so the third theme is around the diversification of the teacher's role. Um, and for most, it was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, they liked to have the capacity to see the lesson in a different way, to move around in a di di different way, um, and to shift their, their goal orientation, so what they wanted to get out of the lesson, moving away from a, you know development of, of specific skills only. Um, and, you know... Well, I don't know, Sullivan talked about the teacher moving away from her position as a provider of knowledge and being able to undertake different roles. Um, and it sparked an interest in their own professional learning. So they were seeing themselves as learner. They knew they needed to learn more about the models. And, and that was sort of invigorating and enthusing them. Um, but... They also reported it wasn't a cure-all, it wasn't a, a, a panacea for changing poor, poor behaviour or overcoming you know, rigorous classroom structures. So there was work to be done in every stage uh, of what they were do, 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 do doing. Right, so um, it wasn't a fix-all, you just drop in a model and then all of a sudden everything has changed. But there's still a ton of work that the, student, uh, the teacher has found. There is, I mean, I've, I've just uh, been reading uh, a lot of papers on models based practice and, and one of the things that comes out of those is this that there are different change agents and one of those is students the way that students perceive a model uh, you know i've used the term not only does a teacher have to learn to teach in a new way but a pupil has to learn to or a student has to learn to learn in a new way so again for them it's a different structure in the classroom it's a different way of being a, being a learner themselves and, and for some of them it's great but for some of them it's a challenge um you know, in terms of what happens. The one thing that I found when, in the literature is when you presented teachers with evidence of effectiveness, so other teachers' stories about how this worked, almost proof that models-based practice worked, that they were more likely to buy into it. So rather than looking for not only a, a theoretical justification, actually the voices of other practitioners who've used it in that spaces and what they've done and how they've overcome difficulties, you know, was a strong... Um, 
motivation for teachers. If they could see alternatives working, then they were more likely to undertake alternatives. So there was a there was a narrative and vocabulary there around um, teachers wanting to see the medium and long term benefits of changing their practice. With all this time consuming stuff they had to do, becoming a learner, learning a new model, they wanted to see that over time this had a you know a significant impact on on the learning that was occurring in their classrooms. And when you could provide that, and when they could understand what might happen next, then they were they were more likely to to sort of buy into that approach. Um, and one of the, the final thing was the, the the university and school collaboration thing. So that when practitioners were supported by university structures, when um, they were um, when the university maintained what Alexander et al. called a watching brief to support these t t t t teachers, um, then teachers were more able to sustain. So when they were moving past that honeymoon and into the more difficult processes, they were able to draw upon support from you know, a wider community. And I do feel now that things like social media are allowing that sort of collaboration to occur more readily. Uh, things like this podcast will uh, help people to engage in some of these processes. So I think we're finding, as academics and as community, ways of, of, of supporting that that isn't necessarily face-to-face. -face. Right, but and it's... the university partnership clearly was key in some of these, but I think with you know the, the way the information travels now, it's easier, even though you don't have a university in your backyard, you can find that structure and help from other places. Absolutely, and I think there's you know there's podcasts and there's blogs and, and there's there's access to information that allows to teachers to engage, and and I think they're learning increasingly, and we're learning increasingly as academics that those conversations can occur quite easily. Okay, and I, I do feel increasingly that you know this the assumption that teachers don't read research is becoming blurred. I'm not saying all teachers do, but there right. are you know much people on. I don't want to say on both sides, in both environments, are, are learning to communicate much better in terms of these processes. Right. So in the discussion section, you start off with uh, stating that the aim of the review was to consider if models based practice is worth doing. Uh, so is it worth doing? What's your take on this? And I know that this has evolved since your since this article in 2014. Uh, so can you kind of speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, my experiences as a teacher, as it's worth doing, um, you know, my experience as an academic working with teachers and, and working with other people is it's worth doing, but it's not an easy ask. Uh, we have to acknowledge that. Um, you know, I wrote a, a blog series recently looking at this process and my advice is start one model at a time, start with one class, you know, Piece of advice is if you've got a class that's not working, you can change it. What you're doing already doesn't work, so try something differently. But you need to invest time in it. Change takes time. Um, not a month, not even you know, not a not a not a semester. Sometimes it's it's about that ongoing development. Is it worth doing? It is, um, but it's an investment. Um, I mean, I found through through this process that when teachers were able to see it working in their own classrooms where they could see examples from other classrooms where it worked where they were supported whether the opportunity to gain access to the information where they took it slowly those are the times when it worked you can't just take a model per se and drop it as you said before and drop it into your curriculum and expect it to work uh, there is no such thing and this has taken me a long time to learn as well there is no such thing as sport education you cannot get sport education and buy it in a shop and put it into your curriculum. You actually have to work with it. You have to mold it and adapt it to fit um, your curriculum, your kids, your your aspirations, your, your, I don't know what the word is, but you and yours, I suppose. Right. So <clears throat> at the end, um, you quote Dune McDonald who uh, says likened innovation to a stone hitting a hen house roof that uh, it causes a lot of excitement and noise, which initially unsettles the chickens, but things soon settle down again quickly enough to their own accord. So in other words, nothing's changed. Uh, do you think that it's true in physical education and uh, that how we've approached models based practice that it's this exciting thing, and then it kind of doesn't actually change the field entirely? 
I think if you take the, the notion of, of Great White Hope, then I think we need to be careful what we set up as the absolute saviour of the subject. And I think that comes to a, a discourse and a discussion around uh, a subject always in crisis, a subject always looking to justify itself. Um, then models-based practice is, is, is not a stone hitting a hen house roof. Um, it, it's actually a, a re location of the hen house itself it's a redevelopment it's a process that you know allows better things to occur but it takes time to do um i think that models based practice has and has for a while been seen as an innovative approach uh, innovation maybe innovation without change but increasingly the vocabulary that i hear when talking to practitioners to aspiring teachers is around models based practice pete's done a good job in the people that I talk to in different countries, and I've had the opportunity to travel to to meet teachers who are understanding these terms and understand what it is to do these things, and they're investing long term in, in the in, in the outcomes. So the danger is it's not it's not a silver bullet. It's not um, it's not the, the magic pill that's going to solve it. It's something that has to be developed and worked on. Um, and I think sometimes it has been a, you know a rebranding. So, you know, one of the criticisms of, of curriculum change is that, well, we'll do what we always did, we'll just call it some, some, something else. Uh, and I think sometimes when you, you get back to the, you know, the water down of cafeteria approach, people are selecting the bits that fit in with what they already do and then branding it in that way. Well, that's not a models-based approach. That's a, a justification for what already exists. It's not necessarily a challenge or change in practice. It's not even a stone. <laughs> it's just a repainting of the hen house. Uh, in that sort of regard. So you know, the question was, you know, is this how we've approached model-based practice? I think possibly in, in some regards. And when it hasn't made changes, then we've seen it and we've put it to one side. The thing we have to acknowledge is that's the honeymoon. The stone hitting the henhouse roof is the honeymoon. That's the, the excitement and, and the noise. And, and, but then it settles down into, in, you know, back to normal. And it's how you maintain that those processes beyond the honeymoon period. So it's innovation with change rather than innovation for innovation's sake. Well, I tried that and it didn't work. Well, did you? Right. <laughs> and did uh, it just not work? Yeah. Or in what ways did it work? So I think that's a great analogy to leave on. I really appreciate your time, Dr. Casey. Uh, for those of you who want to read the full article by Dr. Casey, you can find it in the Physical Education and Sport Pedagogy Journal. It was published in 2014. Uh, so that's all we have for you uh, on this one. Thanks for listening.